Now, I wanted to thank you all for having me here today to talk. Um, you're probably scratching your head right now looking at this title thinking, uh, why, why are we talking about this today? Um, but personally, I think that uh, infection uh, and its role in the epidemiology of complex diseases is incredibly important. And furthermore, for this crowd, um, the interaction between uh, viruses and environmental toxins um, is well illustrated since 1936 when Rouse figured out that malignant carcinoma had a synergistic interaction between coal tar and sarcoma virus. It, um, we paid a lot of attention to gene environment interactions, but um, maybe not quite place as much of a role on virus environment interactions as we should. So with that, maybe we should get started. Um, I, th I thought I'd give a brief primer on infection and childhood leukemia just to, uh, just to get us uh, thinking in the same direction. Um, as we've talked um, uh, at quite a few times today, uh, childhood leukemia is a very heterogeneous disease. And there may be multiple causes um, or indeed multiple hits along this causal pathway towards disease. Um, there, is, there is a growing body of evidence that suggests that one of these hits uh, may have to do with an, either a novel, uh, rare, or indeed a common infection. Uh, two of these main infection hypotheses are well encapsulated between Leo Kinlan's population mixing hypothesis, which uh, came up around um, uh, uh, mi migrations of people around uh, nuclear sites, and uh, Mel Greaves' delayed infection hypothesis, which you can kind of think about as, uh, as, as close to the hygiene hypothesis. Uh, a good analogy to think about is that of poliomyelitis when uh, the entire world was previously infected with polio at a very young age. Um, yet as we got cleaner and cleaner, uh, that infection happened later in life as maternal antibodies would wane off. And then that's when you would have the rare event of paralytic polio. Um, so even w specifically with childhood leukemia, there is some suggestive evidence of the role of an infection. Um, daycare uh, and playgroup attendance, birth order and breastfeeding all seem to decrease risk, although there are um, conflicting results in some studies, although our study has shown this. Um, there is evidence of immune dysregulation from birth, as um, Dr. Wienel's work has shown with, um, with IL-10. And the observance of clusters in childhood leukemia has been uh, noted to be evidence of an infectious cause. Now, the, the fact that clusters of childhood leukemia occur, period, is, I think, still up for some debate. Um, most cluster investigations, including everything which I will present today, uh, has been the result of uh, an analysis after a cluster has already been deemed a cluster. Um, so looking at this from a more population-based approach, which we are hoping to do within the CCLS and are currently underway in the CCLS, um, will give a much better, uh, much better answer to whether these clusters do occur. But if, if we can accept for a moment that clusters of childhood leukemia do indeed exist, uh, the Fallon leukemia one is probably the most poignant example um, that we've had, especially in recent time, but probably ever. Um, so the question today is, what caused the Fallon Nevada leukemia cluster? And I can say with a high degree of certainty that I will not answer this question today. But, uh, <laughs> but hopefully I'll give some very suggestive evidence to and some food for thought. Uh, so this is Fallon Nevada. Uh, it lies about an hour east of uh, Reno or Carson City. Uh, it's kind of in the middle of the desert, in, uh, and it lies within Churchill County. So Fallon, the town kind of city of Fallon, is pretty much the only thing that's in Churchill County, um, besides some beautiful desert. Um, it's a population of about 24,000 people, uh, mainly white population, uh, with about 6,900 children at risk. So it's just some general background on the cluster. It's often quoted as occurring from 1997 to 2003, where about 17 cases uh, were diagnosed with childhood leukemia. Um, subsequently, because of the obser observance of this by some astute clinicians, uh, the CDC was called in to investigate, and the most comprehensive cluster investigation which has ever occurred uh, there commenced. Uh, there were about 1.2 expected cases um, that, that should have occurred during that time, and this is kind of up for debate also. This is, it goes back to this whole idea of a priori clustering. But it kind of, it kind of sets the stage of, of, of the magnitude um, of the amount of cases that occurred in such a short period of time, uh, given that there's only about 24,000 people that live within this area. Um, so what ensued was a case control study of about 205 individuals from 55 families, uh, where the CDC took blood, cheek, hair, and urine samples, uh, as well as household and broader environmental samples from each of these households and around the town in general. Uh, they, they tested 139 compounds, including heavy metals, persistent and non-persistent pesticides, including those used for um, arthropod uh, control, which I'll get to in a minute, 
PCBs and VOCs. As you can imagine, this was very expensive. Um, and they also tested for four viruses, um, human T-cell lymphotrophic virus, feline leukemia virus, avian leukemia virus, Epstein-Barr by four different assays, um, and they also looked for reverse transcriptase activity. They specifically looked, looked for RT activity because um, of the, the tens of different animal leukemias which are known to have an infectious cause are almost all the result of a retrovirus, which violates that central tenet of biology and has an RNA genome. Um, so it, it necessarily has to have reverse transcriptase occurring in order for active um, transcribing and therefore viral replication to occur. So they had an idea that, I mean, this was, this was not within their, uh, this was not off their radar, um, and it was a, 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 at least a good start. But the problem with um, many, um, with, with many tex techniques for looking for infection is you have to know what you're looking for. And that can be very difficult if we are indeed talking about a novel virus. So here's just a um, just kind of a, a, a snippet of one sl uh, one page of the report which came out, and this kind of uh, is the essence of most everything that was found. And rather than going through this in detail due to time, um, it can pretty much be summed up with that line below that there was no conclusive difference between case and control series, and this had to do with all compounds measured as well as those four viruses which I spoke about earlier, including RT activity. Um, there were some noteworthy things uh, in that uh, both in the case of control series, there were elevated levels of both uh, tungsten and arsenic. Um, but in terms of the case control comparison, pretty much nothing was found. So that's where we're left. And what do you do? So you have, uh, you have 17 cases of childhood leukemia at town, which is very upset about it. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, essentially no answer. And that's, that's how we came to approach this. Um, so money had been set aside. Um, by the state of Nevada and the feds to, to take some reanalysis of, of the found leukemias and to see what we could learn, may, what may have been missed, and what maybe could be used going into the future for any future cluster investigations. So we, we started by asking the question, what makes Fallon different? Um, as I stated before, the demographics for Nevada were quite standard for northern Nevada. Um, it is an isolated rural community, which maybe play into this role of population mixing. Um, it also harbors a very large Navy base, which has a, a bunch of people which go in and out of it. It's a, it's a naval air station, and they distribute uh, soldiers to various parts of the world. Um, it also happens to have a very active uh, and large 50,000 hectare uh, flood irrigated far uh, farming activity within the town. And this is because it resides in a, national, in a natural geologic sink. So you usually think about you know, rural Nevada as being quite dry and, uh, and desolate. But when you, as soon as you drive into Fallon, right before you get into the town, it's quite obvious you're driving through all these fields of very green pasture. And that's because of this natural geologic sink. And because of that, they have an extremely active mosquito breeding population. So that kind of piqued our interest in some ways and started to look into a little bit further. So what we found was in 2004, this is after the, the cluster incident, I'm going to state this twice to make sure we're not drawing any inference between West Nile virus and, and child leukemia. Um, but, but as West Nile virus swept across the United States, introduced into New York in 1999, slowly made its way across the United States, its introductory year into Nevada was 2004, where they started taking a lot of data uh, in preparation for um, uh, for the introduction of West Nile virus. And what was noticed was that the, the Churchill County overall, and specifically because there's not many people in Churchill County besides Fallon, um, had orders of magnitude higher uh, rates of West Nile virus. And that's because of this flood irrigated land around the town of Fallon. Um, and this is mainly due to the flood irrigation, and also there is a series, uh, almost a network, of open irrigation ditches that surround the town of Fallon um, that lead to a lot of these flood irrigated wetlands. Um, it, all, all, I'm, all I'm suggesting here is that this is, a, this is a proxy for the capacity of vector-borne disease transmission in and around Fallon. But once again, West Nile virus, no logical link between West Nile virus and childhood leukemia. The temporality is simply not there. So this spawned a hypothesis, uh, which we started investigating, and that the Fallon leukemia cluster may have been a confluence of factors, that an isolated, immunologically naive population of children were more susceptible to a virus-induced leukemia, and that a virus transiently elevated community viral load, possibly as a result of population mixing from the military base, and that an extremely active mosquito or tabanoid population, tabanoids or horseflies, um, served as a vector for the transmission of the virus. These are all just hypotheses. So uh, started on the analysis. Being good epidemiologists, start with person, place, and time. 
So the person already, already reasonably described this. Um, of those 17 cases, 15 were eligible um, due to the CDC uh, uh, case definition of pre-BALL and six months of residency in Churchill County prior to diagnosis. Uh, there was a mean age of five years, which was not outside the normal range um, for child ALL. Uh, and Dr. Wemel's genetic analysis showed nothing beyond normal childhood uh, leukemia anomalies. Uh, and the CDC questionnaire left no association between case and controls. So that's, that's pretty much our person. Uh, what about time? Um, it's quite clear that the cluster window of 97 to 2003 is overly broad, uh, where we can see that nine of these 15 cases that met the case definition were diagnosed in 2000. If we ignore this, uh, this almost outlier of, of, uh, of, of our case occurring around 97, we can see that it's, a, it's almost a very classic epidemic curve with this peak occurring in 2000. Um, and that there's the possibility of a seasonal trending to this. We see the majority of cases occur during midsummer, although it, we're not talking about many cases here, so it's difficult to draw any inference out of that. So what was also happening at that time at that same place? And I mentioned the military base earlier. Um, so we were able to extract 21 million records from a TRICARE database through a Freedom of Information Act request uh, of the 10 years surrounding this, this, uh, the, the cluster period. We used ICD-9 code uh, 40200, which is Incident Childhood ALL Diagnosis, and noted a military-wide increase of, of, of childhood leukemia, specifically ALL, uh, from 1999 to 2000. Um, and you can see the, the, we have all branches presented here, Army, Air Force, and Navy. Uh, Marines don't get their own branch, oddly. Um, and the, uh, the, the combination of those on the black line. Um, interestingly, also, there's a secondary peak around 2004, which um, some have drawn um, some curiosity to with normal cycling of infectious dynamics. Um, th there are some caveats to this, though. We did not request a larger amount of data, say 20 or 30 years, so it's very difficult to draw much, much inference out of this, except for the fact that during this 10-year period, this 99 to 2,000 year time frame had the, the, the largest in incidence of childhood leukemia. And, and also keep in mind, this is military-wide. So this is the entire world of military dependence. So this is not just United States specific. So what about place? Um, these, were the, uh, these are the locations of the occurrence of the 15 cases that occurred uh, in and around Fallon. Um, it, uh, they, they, they've been jittered slightly and enlarged just to maintain confidentiality. Um, but we can see that uh, one case, and this is what, what is designated off to the side. By the way, this is um, remotely sensed satellite imagery that deals with the refraction of light off the surface to designate different land use types. Um, and what we can see from this um, is that uh, one of these cases resided in a developed urban area, one uh, resided in low intensity developed open space, one in the inner mountain mixed sage scrub that you would normally think of around Nevada, yet 12 resided in the agricultural pasture or hay around the town of Fallon. Um, this may be, you, you should immediately think within this, well, there may just be more people living in this agricultural pay, uh, pasture or hay around the town of Fallon. As we know from most geographic projections, the population distribution is not uniform, uh, being that people live in more densely uh, populated areas. And there's a way to control for that, which we did in this study. And it's called uh, density equalized map projection, or DEMP, to where you take uh, a geographic uh, projections such as this, and change the unit um, of space to be the number of people rather than any physical distance. So it's a, it's a statistical transformation that lends itself very nicely to analysis. So when we do that, we get this. Um, and this is, once again, the unit of analysis on this is actually square root of people. So e each, each one of these cells has the same number of people in it. So this is essentially equalizing the density of people across this map. It, it's a little bit hard to understand, but it'll, it'll sink in. Um, and what, what, what becomes clear from this um, is that the cases in, w which occurred in the Fallon cluster occurred around the town of Fallon. And you can see the kind of uh, the remotely sensed image is this, this area here with the orange and gray um, being the m main downtown area of Fallon where these cases occurred around the town of Fallon and not in the town of Fallon. Even though the majority of people, as you can see, just based on the, the amount of distortion this transformation gives, uh, live inside the city limits. And also plotted on here are um, four or five other childhood cancers that occurred in the 10 year period um, subsequent to this. Um, so, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that in a minute. 
Um, so I said that this, this lends itself well stati to statistical analysis because this is a uniform distribution. Because it's a uniform distribution, the variance um, uh, is known and the variance and as well as the, uh, the, the mean are then independent. Um, so I, I won't get into too much detail on how exactly this is done. Um, but what is, what, what is clear from this, and all this test is showing, is that the distribution of these cases around the town of Fallon is not random. That's all it's saying. It's not saying anything towards the shape. But if it was completely random, it would follow directly up this 45 degree line. So another way in which we can test this, um, this is what we worked with the Nevada Cancer Registry, was to use all of the adult cancers that were diagnosed during the 10 year period after the Fallon cluster. And this was used because of uh, the, the, the cancer registry there got the gold, the SEER gold standard for that time period afterwards. So we thought this was better data than the actual data during that cluster period. When we, when we um, do the same statistical test, we get a very uniform distribution showing that, that, those, that the adult cancer cases were randomly distributed around, the, the, around and in the city of Fallon. One last thing we looked at in terms of place was the occurrence of, uh, of of sites in which the vector-borne disease agency of Churchill County was it, were able to trap mosquitoes. Um, now, a, a, a very important caveat I want to state up front was the, these were not sampled randomly. These were sampled in places in which the vector-borne offic officials were able to trap mosquitoes, and they were also placed in places which they knew that they could get mosquitoes. So th there's, a, there's a certain amount of bias here. But as you can see, that the, the, all, all we're saying here is that that this is a proxy for mosquito breeding habitat and showing that, that mosquitoes are indeed around the town of Fallon and not in the town of Fallon. And for those same reasons, we did not want to perform a statistical test, although there is very little uh, uh, evidence of difference between these two distributions. So the, this may sound a little crazy in some ways, um, but the, the evidence for uh, specifically retroviral transmission um, in arthropods is quite strong. Uh, it's been known for quite some time that equine infectious anemia, whose primary transmission route is through horseflies. Um, and the horseflies, literally, this is a, a, a mechanical transmission to where the horsefly lands, and you've probably all been bit by them, and it hurts as they take a little chunk out of your skin, flies over to the next horse, takes, takes another chunk. And even though the virus is exposed to air, it's still stable enough to be able to transmit it. That is the way in which equine infectious anemia is transmitted. Um, murine leukemia virus has been observed to be transmissible between uh, mosquito bites, as well as bovine leukemia virus is transmissible between both mosquitoes and tabinoids. Um, and many experts on bovine leukemia virus uh, suggest that that is the primary route and the reason why 100% uh, of large cattle herds are infected with bovine leukemia virus. And there's some suggestive evidence that HTLV may, be, um, may have the propensity to be transmitted by mosquito. Um, so interestingly, while we were working on this, there, there, there had been no previous work on, on, on what, it, what is the viral makeup of mosquitoes. It's actually a very difficult question to ask in some senses. So um, lots of electron microscopy had been done to grind them up and look inside, and you know, sure, sure enough, you see lots of viral packets. But identifying what those are is a, a much more difficult task until the, our invention of metagenomics. So this year um, was the first time in which three mosquitoes have been ground up in San Diego County and then basically just sequenced, reassembled to look for a uh, known virus. And it was absolutely fascinating what they found. This is about a half list of what, um, of what Wilner's team found, uh, in that uh, they found a, a variety of viruses, including human papillomavirus, which is quite interesting. We've known since 1954 that uh, papillomavirus can be transmitted between rabbits in the wild by mosquito. Um, so, um, uh, once again, no suggestion of childhood leukemia, but it is fascinating they're finding human papillomavirus within mosquitoes. And also, I think, of note, especially if we're talking about very common infections and the relationship to childhood leukemia, are the variety of torctinoviruses or anneloviruses, which have also been found in mosquitoes. Um, now, keep in mind, this is only three mosquitoes, but the first and only metagenomic study done. But anneloviruses are fascinating. Uh, they're probably our most common human virus. We all get them within our first few months of life. Uh, multiple infections are, um, are possible. Uh, multiple infections with multiple genotypes are possible. And we give, we produce lifelong viremia of these very common infections. Furthermore, they're incredibly diverse. And no one really understands why these viruses are so diverse, especially if they're truly non-pathogenic. Um, so that in itself is interesting. So just kind of the wrap up here. Um, this is just an observational study, um, but the concordant increase in military childhood and ALL suggests a possible induction of an agent. 
uh, the rural isolated population may have been very immunologically naive, and, that's, and that the spatial analysis suggests that there's a non-random etiologic driver at work, and that's all we can really draw from that statistical test. Um, uh, Furthermore, the, the observed annulus of cases around Fallon either suggests that, that these children may just be further immunologically naive. They may be more isolated around the town, although that doesn't quite bode with me as well. Or that there may have been vector-borne transmission of this causal agent. And that causal agent may not be a novel virus. It could be a very common virus. And that these children may have been predisposed to uh, an infection-based leukemia due to some other factor. Um, so this is suggestive of a role of an infectious agent in the etiology of child leukemia. Just suggestive, but it's an interesting one. Um, but I think the most important thing that should come out of this, and the whole uh, point of the research in general, um, was that future and cluster, cluster investigations should closely examine the role of an infectious agent. Because it's very difficult to, to explain space-time clustering that is not persistent over time that does not have to do with an infectious agent. Um, so we're not quite stopping there. Um, we do have some next steps regarding Fallon. Um, we're going to use some of these new metagenomic techniques to look for both novel and known virus within a few of these samples within Fallon. Um, we're going to be able to compare some pretreatment and remission samples for these Fallon cluster cases. And we're also continuing a very similar line of study within the California Childhood Leukemia Study. Uh, where we'll be able to use 16 years of residential history from this population-based cohort. And that's a very important question in trying, or a very important data set in trying to answer the question of whether spatial clusters, space-time clusters, of childhood leukemia are occurring on a much finer or greater scale using a population which, which is uh, sampled uh, without any a priori assumption of clustering. And we're also going to be using some of the CCLS samples using the same metagenomic techniques um, to look for novel and known virus. So um, a special thanks to our collaborators and those who helped us uh, in funding this. Uh, and um, thank you to you all.